Okay, so first I have to log in to the machine again since it's been a little while. Let's see, you don't want to see a flower. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming. Um, my talk is, is called uh, Seatbelt, which is a library that we built uh, for Skype um, for service-to-service -service communication. I thought that before I get started, I should really sort of describe what we're doing at Skype with, uh, with, with microservices. Um, you know, there's a couple differences. Uh, we obviously uh, make extensive use of Azure in everything we do. Uh, not that many people are familiar with the cloud features in Azure, so I thought I'd go over that a little bit and sort of give some background on how we got to where we are and why we wound up working on a, a new library for service to service communication. Also because a lot of the reason I like to come to these conferences is just to hear war stories, uh, which I, I can take back and, and share with, uh, you know, share with the, the people I work with. And so I thought I'd share a, a little bit of what we've learned and, and what we do and, uh, and how we approach that. And then to go on to uh, what Seatbelt does and why we're trying to build a, a generic uh, modular approach to service to service communication. So um, before microservices. So, Going back, Skype had a single back-end team, and that back-end team owned all of the databases and all of the front ends, um, and uh, made use of that because since they were one team, any database could call into any other database. And so this is not the actual diagram of our, of our uh, database infrastructure, but I assure you that there is a diagram. Unfortunately, it has function names that I can't show you, but there is a diagram that looks exactly like this that explains the relationship between our databases. And there is a wonderful person, uh, Preet Kustala, in Estonia who spent years of his life working with all of the teams on unwinding who had which dependencies and where they had to go, we've actually unwound that by now. So uh, that's been fixed. But this is where we started from. And we split up the backend team, but the code structure remains. We had to get, uh, we had to get uh, beyond that. Okay, so moving the services to the cloud. It's no great secret why we wanted to pursue microservices to, to anyone here. You know, this is the classic story. We have a large distributed org. There are still today seven engineering sites around the world. Um, they span time zones, so it's a nine hour difference between Estonia and between the West Coast. And those meetings you know, happen regularly. And so you know, the way you structure your life if you work with Skype is that if you're in Europe, you expect that your morning is relatively free, but your evening will be filled with meetings until 6 or 7. Uh, some people dislike those. They just like to meet from 9 PM till midnight. Uh, that range there. And if you work on the West Coast, you expect that you have days when you get into the office at 6 or 5.30 or earlier and, and have your meetings there. So we communicate together. But in the end, what we have are separate teams. And so we try to keep a team in each office. And so the structure very naturally leads itself to co-located small teams that build microservices. We adopted Agile and microservices um, at roughly the same time. We started that a little bit before the uh, Microsoft acquisition. So we had some preliminary work in, in AWS. But as soon as uh, we were really just getting started on that and learning about AWS, when uh, Microsoft bought Skype, and so we said, gee, now we're part of a company that owns its own cloud and builds stuff. And so this, this is a, a, a great opportunity. So, um, okay, so what is, is Azure? Azure's been around for, uh, for several years now. It's the, uh, the number two cloud service provider um, currently. And it offers a pretty wide range of, of, of functionality. Um, there is the, uh, the platform as a service, what they call now cloud services. Uh, the infrastructure, which is currently our, our predominant offering in compute. Um, there's also web apps and Azure Functions. So Azure Functions, AWS Lambda, you can think of as, as pretty equivalent. Um, when we started uh, the, our work, the, the platform as a service was the primary uh, computing paradigm. And so that has web roles. Uh, worker roles, and then you access storage uh, separately outside of your, your service, and you have a, a, a software load balancer that uh, handles all of your incoming traffic. And the, um, oops, wrong button. The big feature here, one of the great features of this was service isolation. 
Um, whereas we, in AWS, we had a, you know Elastic Load Balancer, and then we had several different services behind this. The Azure pattern really enforces complete service isolation. So since we wanted to make sure it's a microservice, it doesn't share databases, this pattern actually worked really well and with, uh, with what we wanted to do. Um, the other implication of, of the Azure architecture is that it's, it's horizontal, it's very flat. Everything is at exactly the same level. A service to service call is exactly the same as going out on the internet and talking to any other service. Um, so it encourages, this encourages um, good isolation, but since everything is the edge, everything is also a security risk. So when you des design your service, you think about, gee, this is called externally, I need to have MTLS authentication, or I need to, uh, I, I need to do something else to secure my, my API for the internet, which ultimately is the way you want to design an API, like it can be called or attacked by, uh, by anyone. Um, other f features of this, independent scaling, this, the services can scale themselves or they can be scaled manually, but all the services scale independent of each other and none of the teams actually know what each other is doing by and large. Um, we went with service discovery via DNS. Uh, at the time, uh, Azure Traffic Manager and Akamai both offer monitoring and, and DNS to find you know, performance around Robin or whatever you want. And there are no application layer load balancers. So if you think you need that functionality, you build it yourself. And it's actually pretty easy to build yourself if you want it. But by default, the, uh, the platform doesn't, doesn't give you that. It doesn't naturally uh, forward different uh, URLs to, uh, to different services. So the approach that we took in Azure. Um, first off, you know, we start with the assumption that we're global scale. Skype has customers around the world. Uh, we have to be real time regardless of where you live. And so you know, that's pretty easy. We just distribute our services uh, around the world. Um, you have to design it to survive no reboots and, and failures. And as you know, designing for cloud services, we always thought that this was sort of fascinating, that the biggest criticism most customers have of Azure is that, hey, Azure will reboot our nodes at any time. We don't like that. You have to stop rebooting our nodes. Um, I always viewed this as a feature because you find very quickly if someone has built a highly available, reliable service, ideally stateless, if they consider their nodes being rebooted as a problem. And so the good thing is, to me, Azure reboots your nodes all the time, and that's fine. That's what they're supposed to be doing, and if you can handle that, you're fine. Um, it turns out that over time, people have complained a lot about this, and so now they actually suspend your nodes for about 15 seconds and then resume them most of the time. This actually caused us all sorts of problems because we had real-time computation going through there, and we were prepared for the thing to be shut down, but not for it to be suspended for 15 seconds. So we actually had to go in and work around their fix of what the public perceived as the problem. But once you design for node reboots, you make your service stateless. This is fine, it happens all the time. Um, you know, we designed to run in N minus one regions so we can tolerate the failure of any, any region. Um, and we don't spend a lot of time thinking about why a region failed. Um, the Azure data centers are typically, um, they don't currently expose availability zones to customers. They do have them now. Uh, that, that, uh, that's been evolving. But we didn't want to diagnose what failed in which data center, in which region. We just pull out of it if something fails, wait, wait until it comes back, and then, then go back in. Um, another philosophy that we took was Skype decided not to build tooling. Uh, we don't build our own tooling. Azure is our platform. If we need a data store to do something else, you know, I see the, uh, the folks in Azure Storage every, every couple of months talk about what we need from Azure Storage or from the, the SQL team or, or whatever it is, and we see if we can get that feature rolled into the platform. So we took a, a hard line that Azure is our platform. Um, and that's been both good and bad over time. There are other teams at Microsoft that took the view of we're going to develop the universal abstraction layer on top of Azure, and that's been successful for them, but it's not nearly as flexible. They can't expl exploit the same things. Um, we did uh, HTTP only for our services. Almost all of our services speak H HTTPS, obviously. Uh, and just straight HTTP with uh, JSON usually. Um, initially, we had a, lot of, made, had a lot of conversation about whether we should do that. Our Amazon services had been using Thrift um, over TCP, and we switched to, uh, to using HTTP. It turns out that HTTP is a really good um, method for managing the load in Azure, because since you're going through the external load balancer for your dependent services, you don't know how many nodes they have. 
you don't know anything about how you should tune your, a pool of TCP connections to make sure you're distributing your requests across all of the nodes. If you use HTTP, you have to establish a lot of, uh, of TLS sessions for those. But because the load balancer is just blindly uh, distributing TCP uh, connections, they're going to wind up being distributed on your, the, the service you're calling evenly. And Windows is actually really good at maintaining a pretty you know, intelligently sized pool. It's not perfect. There's, there's some, some tuning there. But it, it's pretty good at that. So because we're hidden from the, the, what's going on inside our dependent services, that actually turned out to be a, a, a really good mechanism. And finally, we used DNS for service location. And that was simply because we didn't want to have to build, start off by building a giant service discovery uh, system that, that spanned the globe. Azure had a traffic manager, and we were already using Akamai for some other things. And so generally, we, we just went with one of those for, uh, for all of our solutions. OK. So uh, good points of this approach. The best thing is that all the services have been able to make service-specific choices. Yeah, I, I, I put here, we today use every single compute and database platform that Azure ships. Um, primarily, when we started out, we started out saying, well, we're going to build, you know, PaaS use PaaS computing, where you can use Azure storage, a key value, and we're going to use queues to replicate data between our, our, uh, our locations, our deployments. We took that pattern, we built, we'd built a couple libraries early on that helped replicate that data between the locations. And that was the pattern that we expected most of our services to use. But it's certainly not the only pattern. Um, there, you know, we, most of Skype's data is very much key value. But there are a few services that have data that does have relations or that is from vendors that, that wrote it for SQL. And so they use SQL Azure. And that works fine. Um, we also have some of our workloads that are more from the, the uh, Skype legacy data centers that we've moved into Azure. Those were on Linux, and they run today um, on Linux in Azure. And that also works fine. Uh, Azure has released uh, DocumentDB, which is very similar to Mongo, has some great, uh, great replication features, uh, great query, query language features, and we have some teams using that. Um, I'm talking about the, the cloud services, the, the platform as a service. But the truth is, while those are our heavyweight workloads, today the majority of our new services are either designing for or experimenting with either web apps or Azure Functions. Just because, you know, we all want to move on to containers. Containers are awesome. But if you write an Azure Function, you don't even have to run a container. You don't have to deploy that. You literally just have to write your node, you check it in on Git, push it, and it starts to run in the cloud. So you're not even running the service. And so that's one, of the, uh, that's one of the advantages we have of having our teams able to explore those is that some, some of the teams that are just building sort of lightweight, low transaction services right now are exploring those patterns. And that's turned out to be, uh, to, to be very helpful. Um, but in general, the balance that the teams pick depends on what their load is. So the real-time services, we push really hard on multi-master and eventual consistency. Uh, if, we need to, if we need writes to happen anywhere, uh, we need reads to be super fast. We need that sort of behavior. For the slower services, don't have as many real-time requirements. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll use a single master, or sometimes they, there's a couple cases where they have databases that are just in one continent uh, because they have other, other performance requirements. So there's no one single pattern that, uh, that we've used everywhere. Um, challenge was, challenges that, that we had to solve. Um, there are a lot of load challenges that we have to deal with. One is that we have new cloud services. They're great. They, sc they scale dynamically. That's fantastic. But a lot of times, we still have dependencies with sharded SQL, which is what we've been running for many years. And we know a lot about how to do that. But ultimately, it doesn't scale the same way. And so one of the first things you have to do when someone sp spins up a new cloud service that that's, uh, has parsed something that depends on a query to SQL is make sure it doesn't destroy the SQL database, because it can scale and, and really overload it. So we had to do that in a lot of cases. Um, this load and scale being opaque to the, the consuming services, um, this is good and bad. It's, you can't distinguish between overload and failure externally. It doesn't necessarily matter what you did, but you have to then write code that backs off and then, and then tries to see if that service has, has come up again. And that's a little bit challenging for some of our teams. Uh, the failures are completely independent. 
all these, everything deploys to sometimes the same data centers, sometimes different, but there's so much different hardware and different uh, buildings in Azure that the, the services fail completely independently. Sometimes your components can fail independently. Your storage and your compute can be in completely different places. Um, and one of the things we have to deal with a little bit is some of the Azure services, the, the table storage, um, has experienced noisy neighbor problems. And so we, we have a sharded, uh, we use storage, we actually shard table storage across multiple different uh, accounts within Azure, and one of them slows down, that creates uh, interesting performance problems uh, that our services had to deal with. Okay, so to deal with all the failures that happen in, in the cloud, um, we have a lot of different techniques, and none of these are, are, you know, are revolutionary ideas. Um, a number of teams built rate limiters, um, HTTP pool, Windows by default has an HTTP pool, but it turns out it doesn't grow quite as fast as you want, and sometimes it, does, it either caps or doesn't sustain as many idle connections as you want, if you want a pool of ready uh, HTTP connections set up so you can send your query immediately. And so teams, a couple teams wrote, um, wrote uh, custom pooling logic to handle that. Um, circuit breaker pattern, very common, don't hammer it if it's dead. Um, exponential back off. Everyone knows, a great thing about our educational system, every software engineer comes out of college knowing that to solve any reliability problem, they have to implement exponential backoff. Uh, and, and so all, everyone does this. Um, we have uh, paired deployments. Because we use DNS for failover, DNS is kind of slow. So for some cases where we need a very rapid failover, the client could drive it by having the service partition into A and B sets and then the client could actually query A and then query B if A didn't respond quickly enough. Uh, if you play enough with DNS when Skype is running, you can actually see the Skype client doing that uh, with uh, a couple of our client-facing services. But by and large, we, we do that service to service, not, not for the clients. Um, a very so re retransmission queues, um, that's always, always fun, neat things you can do with queues. And of course, we use both Azure and Akamai Traffic Manager. They both have uh, di different, slightly different feature sets. We just pick the best one. Okay, so the great thing is that you can put all these together and come up with a fantastic way to totally destroy another service. So here's a system. Uh, we have a team that built a great telemetry system, and it really is a, a great telemetry system, all, all sorts of, of uh, great data we get out of it. And they also wrote their own library, and they wrote their library to make sure that the data got there and it didn't overload their service that was gathering all the telemetry. And so what they did is they put an exponential back off because obviously if the ser service is overloaded, you want to have exponential back off. But they wanted to make sure the data got there, so they put in a retry queue. So all of their messages get retried, they want to make sure they get it if they can, and it retries them 10 times. And 10 times, the exponential back off takes a while, and you hope that over, over I think it's 20 minutes or whatever they, they had that, that retry lasting for, you hope that it's going to get through in that time. Um, and they also had the behavior, which is, is common in the Windows HTTP client, that if you get a 500 response from the service, you close the TCP connection. And all of this works great. It was up for months and months and months. And then one day, it overloaded. Well, what happens when it overloads is it overloads and either it stops responding entirely or it starts returning 500s because it's overloaded. Hey, I want to shed some load. I'll get, drop the connection. Well, the problem is that even though they had exponential back off, you notice they didn't say that they lowered the rate they were sending messages. And so the telemetry is still being produced at the same rate it normally was, only now every message was sent 10 times. So you multiply the load by 10 times, but because the session is being closed on 500, instead of one TCP connection that's just sending 10 messages a second, now you have 100 messages a second trying to open a new TCP connection, which is an SSL handshake. And we, this uh, happened, and we had, I think, four of our highest load services pushing data to this telemetry service. And so we had, I think, about 6,000 cores that were essentially dedicating themselves to dosing the telemetry service. A and when they designed this, they said, hey, this is safe. It's reliable, and it's safe because it's exponential back off. Um, it's important to know where, what's exponential. It wasn't the, the try rate. Um, okay, head of line blocking, this is really simple. It turns out that in Windows there's a limit to the number of parallel HTTP connections it'll open by default. And if you've tuned Windows 
um, for a while, then you know that there's a parameter you can change to increase this, or you can write your own custom pooler. But if, let's say, you're a Linux developer who's been learning C Sharp and is deploying something at cloud, you have no idea what's going on in your system. And so you say, you tell the service you're calling, hey, your latency is too high, you gotta fix it. And they look and they're like, sorry, that's all we're getting. So this is another very common, uh, you know, not exactly a failure, it's, it's just that when you're not familiar with the load behavior of the system you're working with, a, there's a problem. Um, and then we have uh, database lags. This is the storage hiccups and things. Um, and a number of services that are driving their normal transaction rate, and then all of a sudden the database latency quadruples, and they start suddenly open a whole bunch of new connections in order to satisfy their, uh, their existing query rate. DNS failover is not fast enough to react to that. Um, scaling up in Azure uh, on PASV1 takes a while. You can't react to this. You have to shed the load. Ideally, the client takes their load elsewhere, but that takes a, a little bit of work. And uh, Azure Traffic Manager and Akamai, you know, these are the, the, the traffic manager solutions. Um, it's always been a challenge to make sure that the health probe you have in your traffic manager is exactly the same as what the client is doing. It's far better to rely on your client for whether that dependent service is healthy. And so, you know, Akamai and, and, and Wadham are both great services, but uh, between the traffic probe always being a little bit different than what the clients actually do, and between the time it takes for them to decide, hey, that's really down, update their database, propagate that, and then the number of companies that sell DNS optimizers, uh, which is a fantastic feature, you know, just do DNS but ignore TTLs, then sell this as a product. Um, DNS just, just isn't, a, uh, isn't a good enough solution for the, the, failure, the failures we saw. So the basic problem here is that because we didn't build the common tooling, although the teams had the flexibility to, to implement what they needed, and practically all of them you know, took a really responsible uh, approach to figuring out what they needed to do to solve their communication patterns, none of them had all of the pieces. They had some subset of the pieces, um, and the result is that you, know, you go to, to the live site review of, for the week, and there's another outage that was caused by some missing piece, and it's a different one every week. So, um, and, and basically, this is the problem with the microservices distributed organization. With the microservice teams, we have application domain knowledge, sometimes it's database, sometimes it's web. Um, we, you know, we have people who, who focus on, uh, on, on image sharing and, and things like that. And, but they're not network engineers. They don't know how the network works. And then with the distributed teams, the hallway conversation doesn't work as well. So it's great when you can have hallway conversations, and we have Skype chats and things, and lots of stuff happen in, in the Skype chats, but still you can't distribute the knowledge uh, quite as easily. So you wind up with very segmented knowledge. And in fact, even today we have shared code, but different offices frequently have their own shared code that they, they talk about and share within the office, which is this fascinating cultural issue where somehow if you can sit down next to someone else, you can use their code, but if they're three hours away, somehow you can't trust their code anymore and your needs are different. Um, I don't understand that actually, but because you would think that for a company that does chat and video calling, we would have a way of communicating about this, but, uh, but no, uh, we're also all engineers and we're very good at dissecting the problems in someone else's code until you drink beer with them, and then you decide that you know, your problems are my problems or, or something like that. Okay, so this is what led to the creation of, of Seatbelt. There's other pieces of, uh, of, you know, of uh, tooling that we have, but this is the, you know, one of the, the ones I think is, is interesting uh, to, to talk about here. And the problem basically is every microservice that we built had between 75 and 90% of the problem solved. Most of the solutions actually are pretty good. Some of the team shared solutions. But they had this problem where the solution that they built for their retries or the rate limiter, what their, whatever it was, tended to wind up being integrated somewhat into their own service and not easily extractable to, for some other purpose. So what tended to happen was maybe they'd take another service and they'd start with that code and then they'd refactor it a little bit, but it, it, it couldn't really be shared. And with the, uh, you know, this is the 20% the, the question that, that I think someone asked the, uh, uh, in, in an earlier, uh, in, in an earlier session, um, it's hard to, for, to get convinced management to give you the time it takes to really work on something that's going to solve everyone's problems. So instead, everyone had a, had a different solution. 
But the truth is that 90% of the services need the exact same solution. Maybe they need some slight variations. Maybe they need, you know, maybe it's, it's call setup. The great thing about call setup is you don't need to worry about your, uh, your call setup after about seven seconds because the person hung up. It really doesn't matter. And so, so you know, for call setup, if you're going to do a retry, you better do it fast. Uh, for, you know, chat push notification to a phone, Eh, you know, we'd like to get the pushes within a couple seconds, but if they're occasionally 30 seconds late, it's probably fine. So, you know, a few parameters like that. Um, and obviously, there's lots of existing work. Um, Hystrix is, is one uh, we, we looked at a lot. Uh, we're obviously a C sharp shop, um, not Java. Even if we were using Java, we would have had to make some changes. Uh, you know, Google has a great paper on uh, the, the tail at scale. There's lots of work uh, in, in this space. Um, but we needed to put together the pieces that we need and get it integrated in, in our environment. So our goal was to build a system that everyone can use 90% of the time. You just pull it in, set a few parameters, and you go. But we also wanted to make it modular so that the teams did have special requirements that needed uh, so something unusual. Like when I retry a request, I might aggregate it with some, some data that's come in. And actually, what I'm retrying is a different request. It just has, has more data in it now. We wanted to support those needs as well so they could make use of things like the circuit breaker pattern, not have to reinvent that, but just write the parts that they, uh, that they needed. So the 90% pitch. The 90% pitch that the teams need is basically an HTTP client that does magic. And as long as they have that, that's what they need. So you know, we built this for high traffic service to service. Um, it does all of these things that people had most of the pieces of, but hopefully it do does them well. And also supports things that were sort of hard to do, like migrating traffic for, to support side-by-side -side deployment of your dependent service. We want to be able to migrate 1% of our traffic over to the new version, make sure it works. Uh, before we migrate the rest of it. Otherwise, you wind up with a Skype chat and an incident call at 3 a.m. Um, and when you have a nine hour difference between working times, um, it's not a matter of someone deploying at 5 p.m. because every time is someone's 5 p.m. or midnight. Uh, so, so we wanted to be able to do this, this fractional failover. And you know, we wanted to be able to, the denial of service, the cascading failures. You know, we've, we've found all sorts of what, neat ways you can cause cascade failures. Um, and uh, not everyone understands them until they've written the code and then seen it actually crash in, in production. So the way this works, um, you know, there's the seatbelt library that you put as part of your, your service. We have a configuration service that's used to configure uh, both our clients and services. You set, put a few settings in the configuration service. Um, sort of the, the base and default config is in the, in the deployed service itself, and then that tells it how to call all of the dependent services. Otherwise, this looks just like an HTTP connection. And actually, we have this um, hidden a lot of times uh, behind the scenes in some of the other libraries we share, where uh, you don't even know you're using this library anymore for service-to-service uh, -service communication. OK, so we had a great chance to observe what happens when you do have this sort of support, when you don't have this sort of support. And so the, uh, let's see, can you see the colored lines there? So the blue line, if you can see it's blue, I can't see the color difference on my monitor. The blue line is, um, is our chat service. Now, chat service that we're using today is it's evolved, but it was originally the messenger service. So it's been around a very long time. It's very stable code, um, you know, working on refactoring it and evolving it. But it's very stable code, been around a while. Um, and then the green line is the contact service. And uh, I think this particular functionality is, is um, that we're showing here is we're sending notification to a Skype client that you have a, a new contact request or that one of your contacts has, has changed something important, uh, like their display name or, so, or something like that. Um, so what you have here is that um, there was a brief spike about there in the latency of a query that the push service was doing. It was actually to another service, but ultimately it was, was uh, Azure Table Store. And all of a sudden, the query latency uh, went up by a factor of about five. And so what happened was the chat service was continuing to push its messages at the exact same rate as it always had. But since the latency increased for the responses, it simply opened more TCP connections to the service. And all of these are SSL, SSL handshakes. Um, the contact service said, gee, that deployment's down. It started to round robin its load to the other push uh, deployments around the world. Whereas the chat service said, I'm just going to keep trying you and keep sending these messages to the same deployment um, until you start responding better. And so 
it got, the load goes up to there. Uh, the push notification service, this particular deployment was testing auto scale, and so it was running at 75% CPU normally, and it would have been fine if this had gradually happened, but instead, now it takes 20 minutes to scale up, so that doesn't happen fast enough. Um, this is the gap when the system was too overloaded to even record telemetry about what was happening. Uh, and literally nothing was happening. Um, the reason the green line is zero is because all that traffic is going somewhere else. The reason the blue line is zero is because nothing's actually happening. Uh, and all they did ultimately was they just scaled up the push deployment to a factor of four. That was enough to absorb the load. Um, and then in the postmortem, we discussed why haven't you actually finished getting seatbelt integrated with your, with your code yet. Um, that's sort of a, of a you know, worst case scenario of what can happen when you, you don't do the right things. Um, this is a simpler case where we have a, a front end connection service that uses a, what's called the policy controller to determine whether the client should be able to connect. It's based on authorization, rate limiting, and a few other things. Um, but the, the uh, policy controller's load uh, or latency has always been a little bit spiky, and the team hasn't quite figured out why, but it's not a high enough priority service to actually cause problems. But every once in a while, we get above like five seconds, which does cause us some performance issues. And so the, uh, the Trotter team implemented seatbelts so they could hit different deployments and pretty much eliminated any meaningful spikes from the data just by doing this. It took them about a week. So that was, uh, that was good to see, and we, we improved the, uh, the system after that to hopefully make it even easier. Along the way, we learned a few things. So when the team started working on Seatbelt, one of the things we believed we needed to have was the ability to measure latency of the responses you're getting from another deployment, and then to base your traffic routing decision on that latency. And so we actually spent a lot of time on that. But the problem with observing latency and using that to make your routing decision is that latency is also a, fu it's a function of several things. It's a function of speed of light, it's a function of load, it might be a func function of other things going on with that deployment. If you, and if we made our routing decision based on latency, we'll always route to the lowest latency site, the problem is that that can change based on load. And the problem is as soon as you do that, we have an oscillation. And so even in test, we were able to trigger oscillations using the late latency sensitive uh, measurement that we were really unhappy with. And so we actually got rid of that, and rather than doing anything smart, and this is keep it simple, stupid, there's just a table that lists the Azure data centers and it tells you which one is closest. And most of the time, this actually really isn't controversial. If you're in Northern Europe, Western Europe, uh, for those of you who don't know where Microsoft data centers are, Northern Europe is Dublin and Western Europe is Amsterdam, and, and so they're in almost exactly the same place. They also have this neat property where if you do performance-based routing, Dublin isn't used by anyone. Um, except for Ireland. Even London goes to Amsterdam uh, for, for a lot of uh, performance-based routing, and so, which leads to this fascinating conversation of whether what you want is actually lowest latency routing. But regardless, we just go with a static distance list because this has the advantage it's perfectly stable, and since the most common failover pattern we implement is you use your lowest latency solution, and when that fails, you just go to round robining around the rest, so you spread out the load in case of any failure. This actually works fine. Don't need to do anything smarter. Um, and then we use the configuration. This is just, just JSON. It has a few um, parameters, ratio, how much traffic goes to each deployment. I'll talk about why we do it that way in a little bit. Uh, the trip threshold, which is what the circuit breaker does um, when, it, when the circuit breaker opens and when, when it closes. And uh, also whether it's enabled, because when you have failures that don't look like failures to the client, ultimately you still need to go into configuration some way and say, no, stop talking to them. Please, stop talking to them. Okay, so like I said, we built this you know, using a modular solution. So even though there's the standard 90% solution, it's actually just composed of modules. You can take this and build it, your, build it yourself. Our goal, and initially when we first started working on Seatbelt, all of the team looked at it and said, well, that isn't exactly what I want. So they take the modules, they build their own, and everyone had fun with it. But, but we've been working to make sure there's enough tuning in the standard chain that most people are happy. And then for the people who have weird requirements, you, you can take the blocks and, and do what, what you want with them. But the standard thing that we do is we deploy uh, a, a retry block it's important not to retry too many times. Remember the 10 times retry. Uh, what we generally do is recommend you not retry more than 10 or maybe 20% of your requests. But again, it depends on the, on the problem domain. Um, the ones that aren't real time, you can actually retry all of them very slowly uh, if you're careful about it. Um, and then a resource pool. There are actually two tiers of resource pools here. 
And the reason there are two tiers is that we actually distribute load in two different ways. One is between the different deployments, so Northern Europe, Western Europe, and Central US in, in this case. And the other is we do side-by-side -side deployments. So whenever we roll a new version, we stand them up in all of the same uh, data centers that the previous version was in, and then we then, usually we gradually roll traffic in one region over, and then we roll it over uh, again gradually in all the other regions. So it's very common for each region to have multiple deployments running, and with uh, ratios depending on where they are in their uh, the particular phase of operations. Um, so then the, the resource poolers there, and then the circuit breaker is the final, uh, final block. That's, uh, that's most of what we need for our, our standard case. And so the way this would normally work is that if you're running your service in Northern Europe, 99% uh, of your traffic is gonna also go to Northern Europe. And then we send a little bit of traffic to the other, other locations, and that's really just to keep the, uh, the connections hot. We, we need enough connections to know, to know that if we do the failover, there's a warm connection pool. We need to have an idea of the health of the deployment so you know which one is the failover. And so we try to route usually about 1% of traffic somewhere that's uh, not optimal, but hopefully, uh, hopefully is still working. In the event of failure, um, what actually, now it's important to remember that this isn't a tree that we just find the closest solution at the edge. What actually happens if the deployment has failed the, and the circuit breaker is open, it actually throws an exception back to the retry block and then it tries again. And the reason we do that is that this deployment that's only supposed to getting 1% does not want to get the 99% of the load that this other deployment was getting instantly because that would cause a cascade. So instead we follow the global retry rules which say to spread it around all of the other locations. And alarms go off, someone gets woken up. Uh, it's actually up to the teams whether they get woken up for this. Uh, some teams have decided that they're happy as long as it's just one deployment that's down, don't bother to wake them up. It works fine too. Um, but this is, this is what it does in production. And then once it comes back, that goes back. If they were rolling over the traffic, um, they, then these numbers would shift gradually. And you do that all through the configuration based on, uh, based on health metrics. Um, we've implemented hedged and tied requests. So for calling, um, I drew here, if calling needs to send a push notification to make your phone ring, uh, is the most common scenario, um, then we can do, do a tied request and send it both to, to both primary and one of the secondary deployments and wait for the response. Um, in practice, we haven't actually done that. What we've found is that our three nines for, uh, for the, the register I look up is within about 100 milliseconds, and we're actually okay just waiting the 100 milliseconds for both the real time and the, the non-real time, and so we do a hedge request for both at, uh, I think it's, one, it's 250 milliseconds right now is uh, where we're doing the hedge request. We don't actually use the, the tied requests, uh, but that's in the standard seat belt, so depending on your, you know, the team's particular use case, they can, uh, they can do whatever they want there. Using it in code, um, I apologize if you're not familiar with C-sharp, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, this looks almost exactly like, uh, like you're um, using a regular HTTP client except with a couple extra parameters that are, are your defaults for uh, what you're looking for out of the, uh, the seatbelt library. Otherwise, um, it's just your standard uh, C-sharp uh, asynchronous uh, language-based uh, query. Um, tuning knobs. You saw the, the knobs for the deployment weights and the failover pattern. Most of our teams just use you know, closest is 99% and then round robin. That's, that's, you know, that's your generic safe pattern. Um, a lot of different opinions as to how many times you should retry requests and what the behavior should be on retry. So uh, some, some of the, the uh, service service queries don't get retried at all. Others get retried a, a bunch of times. Um, instrumentation, this is always a big problem with the, you know, with the each team does their own service to service calls, is that you go in to figure out what's going wrong and everyone had different instrumentation. We've gotten a lot closer to getting better instrumentation and the same system performance counters and all, all the services. Uh, one interesting thing we didn't realize is response code behavior. Anyone who speaks even a little bit of HTTP knows that 400 is a client-side failure, that's a permanent failure, you know, push it back to, to the consumer, and 500 is a service failure. If you have a different service, server you can query, you can try that other server. Oh, except for 429, which is, which is rate limit exceeded, which is sort of like a 500, except it's a, and you're the evil guy, 500, stop overloading me. Well, that should behave the same in seatbelt as 500, and after we 
got this out to enough teams, we found that a bunch of teams use response codes in ways that, the, that you know, I, I don't think the HTTP you know, spec thought of. And so you can actually customize which response codes are permanent failures and which should be retried and which should be retried immediately and which should just should be retried according to the normal algorithm because everyone has their own opinion as to what this relationship should look like. Um, so part of the purpose of this was the modularity. Um, we built this for service to service calls with the idea that the client calls this and they spread their load around. And so naturally the first production use of this was actually to, for ingress filtering on a service rather than, client, rather than the client side of the equation. Because we had a very, very large system um, that was, we were migrating data to and as they, we migrated data they had to make a call back into the legacy system. The problem is the legacy Postgres system didn't have good rate limiting. It had the great behavior that when you overloaded a shard, the shard just stopped doing useful work. And so we needed to rate limit those requests uh, on, on the server side, and they actually, rather than just return 500s or something, which the new system didn't like, which is a very long story, um, they actually used, uh, used seatbelt, but on their, their inbound traffic side instead of their outbound traffic side. It, it worked fine. It just wasn't what we built it for. Um, and then uh, this one has not actually been deployed. We, we designed the code, but haven't actually, the, the team, that, the telemetry team that caused the incident, uh, they fixed their code in other ways just to limit the overall rate. But, um, but we actually built a uh, example pipeline where we wrote a, a, took the generic block interface and we wrote an aggregator and a filter out of that. And so we would put telemetry into it. It would take telemetry for about a second, put it together in one message, send it. If it failed, the retry block kicks it out on the, on the failure, and then it gets filtered, re-aggregated, and then goes back into the queue. And so if it's been a while sending it, it will drop the lower priority messages. Um, we have a different implementation of this that actually is on the cl for client-side telemetry, but, uh, but they, they don't use seatbelt. So this code is around. We're not using it right now, but it was a pretty, uh, good proof of concept that we could actually make, uh, make good use of the, uh, of the modularity. Okay, status, we have a deploy for about half of our critical service, service scenarios. We've been rolling it out slowly, trying to make sure we do have the knobs. We're pretty sure we have the right knobs right now, but we're still fine tuning a little bit. I'd hope to say it was open source. I haven't gotten permission to open source it yet. Um, I, I will, uh, we will release it when we can. Uh, we're trying to open source it internally and, and within my, Microsoft uh, at first, um, but, uh, but anyway, so I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about what we learned from our uh, complete freedom and no tooling approach and some of the things that, that we built to solve what teams did with that. And I should thank the team that uh, has done most of the development on that and especially uh, Andre Mirza and uh, Martin Koppel who uh, did um, an earlier presentation on this that I uh, used some of their, their slides and illustrations from. Um, any questions? The, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I didn't quite understand, uh, two questions. I didn't really quite understand the hedged and tied retries. So a, a hedged request, so, so that terminology comes from the, the tail at scale paper that, that Google wrote. And a hedged request is I send out one query and then I have a timer. And if I don't hear within my timer 100 milliseconds, I send another. But regardless, I use the first response that comes back. And so as long as your queries are idempotent, this is fine and perfectly safe. Tie just means I don't set a timer, I just send them simultaneously. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the other question is, um, how did you drive adoption of this tool throughout the teams? Was it more of like a mandate or kind of like a, hey guys, this is great? <laughs> Um, our culture doesn't do mandates really well. I mean, that, the, the, freedom, the freedom of implementation wasn't just accidental. Um, or, 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 that, that wasn't a mandate exactly. Um, you know, some teams have been strongly encouraged. So within my engineering group, uh, we're strongly encouraged, but you know, it comes down to prioritization. The best way to encourage, though, is to, at live site, discuss why you failed. And discuss why, if you had just implemented this, you know, your call using this library, then this, would have, then this wouldn't have been an incident. And can we get this as a repair item on your backlog, please? So, so you can, and then some other teams say, gee, I don't want to have that conversation during, during live site review. So it, it's, um, once it, we had to get it to the point where we had like that graph of, of chat versus contacts, 
that's a powerful statement when you can say this one thing you know, didn't, didn't make the outage worse and they were totally immune from any ill effects of it and the other wasn't. As soon as you can have that graph and say this really worked, um, and, and it took us a while to get it so that like, it, everything was working and you know, we removed some features. Like I mentioned the, the latency measurement. There were a couple other features in there. We thought it'd be great. It turned out it was too complicated, so it took a while to get to where we really wanted to aggressively push it. All right, uh, two questions. The first one is uh, when you need to do split or hedge requests, like when you send duplicate requests, do you have any special handling when you send a dupe request to a service that will set itself request more? No, so, so the, the, when we send the hedge request, we normally send it to a different deployment, but they have to be item potent. So it has to be you know, something where it doesn't matter if both requests get handled. Um, that, I mean, that's really kind of true with any, any, any form right, of, right. of retry. But I'm thinking of when you have a very deep RPC. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so we, we've actually been debating this because we have one chain that's three layers deep. And we looked, we, so we did the math. We don't actually care that much. So, so, so the failures are rare enough and the load can be handled at the lower layers that there's a certain amount of why fix it if it's not a problem. Um, we're, what I want to do is with that system, I want to have the second tier be able to send like a 100 uh, provisional response, you know, which, which like in SIP, that's standard, the, the, you know, 180 ringing. Um, I want to be able to do that. The Windows HTTP client doesn't support delivering that up to the app layer. And so there's this really beautiful solution that I can't implement. Um, and so we've been debating what, how we want to handle that, but, but the ultimate answer is it's just not that important because the, the, the systems involved can handle the load. All right, second question. Given that you now kind of own both ends of communications, are you looking at not using HTTP? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. Now, given that you seem to own both the client and the server in a lot of cases, are you looking at just not using HTTP anymore? Um, we're not just because the behavior of having lots of parallel connections turns out to be really like the right thing in this model where you can't see the scale of your dependent service. So it, it's turned out that once we, as long as we can throttle or shed the SSL handshakes, it's really not a problem. Um, you know, the, for, for instance, with, I'm really looking, in fact, you know, one of the talks I was looking forward to, I appreciate you all coming here because if it hadn't been my talk now, I would have been in the HTTP2 session. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in that, but I'm interested in that from the client to server perspective. We're not going to deploy that for service to service because HTTP2 puts all of the requests on one socket, which with the, uh, the TCP layer load balancer means they all go to one machine. And so if you have you know, a few clients generating load on lots of servers, you won't get distributed loads. So um, I wasn't a fan of this. I actually really loved Thrift uh, when we were doing that. But, but it's hard to justify spending work on it because that's, that's not a, a problem for us right now. Yes? Um, as this is a library uh, yes. that you use to own all the service-to-service -service communication, that limits you to a particular runtime? And I understand C Sharp has the CLR and there's languages on that, but it does limit you. Was there internal, do you, did you give a damn? And if so, what was the internal calculus around that? This, yeah, this is C Sharp CLR. Um, and you can call it from anything that runs in CLR, but in practice. And was that like the only runtime that, that you as a company wanted to deal with? Did you worry about, did, did, did that, you worry that like not going to, well, we can be polyglot to yeah. microservices? Yeah, that, that's the only runtime that we run in, that's, that's not the only time, that's the majority runtime we run in Azure and for the high scale cloud services it actually is the only runtime. We actually have a much, much older version that looks remarkably like this that's in C++ um, that, that, we use, that we use on the Linux uh, services that, that we still have. Um, that was never open source and honestly it hasn't been maintained in a really long time and there are other solutions there. Um, so. We, we built this for C Sharp. We haven't really worried ab about it. You know, like I said, if we were in the Java environment, we probably would have taken Hystrix and may, maybe, uh, you, you know, maybe submitted some pull requests for features we needed. Um, but we probably would have started there. But, uh, but yeah, CLR. I mean, we're, we're actually excited. We're going to port this to .NET Core so we can run it uh, in, in Linux as well as Windows and on Nano servers soon. But we have we don't have a need right now to port it elsewhere. And then early on, you said you didn't want to build tools. You wanted to use the platform, like Azure as your only platform. 
but then you talked about telemetry. And from my point of view as an app developer that stumbled backwards into DevOps, like telemetry is part of the platform. So I was, you said you transitioned later on into making your own tools, but I wanted to ask you like early, earlier in the, in the situation, where did you draw that line between things that we didn't want to build and things that we were comfortable building that would qualify as infrastructure? Um, yeah, that, 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 I think that's sort of a you know it when you see it kind, kind of answer. I mean, t t telemetry obviously is absolutely part of the platform. And, and in fact, when we first adopted Azure, we, I wouldn't say fought is the wrong word, we basically said we weren't gonna do it until we at, had access to their internal telemetry system. Because when Skype adopted Azure, it, that was just becoming feasible when we were acquired. And so all of the other Microsoft services were in other systems. And the notion we would start running our, our you know, line of business in Azure was, like most people didn't believe it was going to happen at that moment. Whereas since we didn't have any, anything in the legacy infrastructure, we're like, okay, we need that. Telemetry was actually one that we said, we will not adopt this unless we can get access to your internal telemetry. They let us in. It's a classic story where it worked great, but it wasn't, multi-tenancy was never a design feature. And so it totally broke. And I mean, it didn't break, but it was just horrendous. And like we had to talk to the dev team every week to get something changed. Um, today it actually is multi-tenant. It's fantastic. It's real time. It breaks into a million different categories. It, it's, it's, today it's wonderful, but that is really part of the platform. And yeah, core things like that. And uh, you know, we really did insist had to, had to come from Azure. Um, it, could you tell us a little more about uh, your interaction with the uh, Azure uh, platform team and like you making other requests for? Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is one of the great things about being part of the same company as in you know, the cloud provider is, is that you know, we don't just evaluate what they do. We, we can actually go in and make requests. Um, and there's been a number of times you know, with storage and, and networking, um, the way that they, the load balancer handled UDP originally wasn't compatible with, uh, with media or with NAT traversal. And you know, since we had the relationship, literally I was in a meeting room with like their three leads. In my background, I, I did not spend a lot of time doing peer-to-peer -peer and, and SIP. Um, and so I was able to, to draw on a whiteboard why NAT traversal works the way it does and how you, know, and how you, you build a load balance to be compatible with it. And they made the change within three months. Uh, and, and, so, and that works fine. And we actually do NAT traversal for some of our media stuff. Uh, over UDP. There's other times when, you know, like, like, like um, with storage, we want, wanted some improvements to the, the table store because we're very key value focused. Um, you know, Azure's business focus was improving um, the IaaS offering with virtual disks. And to the business, that was the top priority because you know, a hybrid on-prem is great offering we have for, for Windows customers. And you know, we're not able to, to justify, because they're like, well, what will you do if you don't have this? Well, we're gonna shard and we, might switch, we might, might switch to a different data store or something and we'll just work around the latency in other ways. Like, okay, you should do that. Um, so uh, it's, it's great to work with them and it does help things and we contribute to them and, other t and they contribute to us and sometimes they tell us that that's great, but you know, we don't have to do that because it's not a high enough priority, so. Um, if you weren't part of the same company, um, would, you, would you have taken that stance or would you have gone with, yeah, we have no control over these folks, we need to, or no influence rather, we need to build our own stuff? Um, I, I mean, obviously, you know, obviously we didn't have quite as much of a choice, but like I said, we use Akamai for, for quite a few things actually. Um, you know, if we need to go elsewhere, we could have, but, but part of our job is, you know, part of our job is to make sure Azure is a viable computing platform. And so, you know, they've, they worked on like the, the infrastructure, the IaaS had to be improved. Right now, um, you've seen, uh, I think either we're about to officially announce that it's public, we're gonna announce it, we're announcing uh, Linux containers running in Service Fabric, Service Fabric for Linux. Uh, and so you're starting to see sort of the next gen cloud service offerings appear. And uh, so our, our job is much more to, to make sure uh, that, that you know, we're building a, a, you know, a, a cloud scale service and, and to point out any, any shortcomings. But that was understood when you were acquired that you would be sort of the, a, a, a guinea pig for this thing and, and yeah. report yeah, back so. and help shore up the, as opposed yeah. to just some company that used yeah. their stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, in the end, you know, there, there, Skype does not have outages that, like, gee, we wouldn't have this if we were in AWS. You know, AWS, we would have had different outages. 
Um, you know, but the, we have the, we've been able to build what we need, and we've been able to get the features we need. Thank you. I'm not sure if I heard you properly earlier on. Um, you were saying with noisy neighbors, one of your things you did, you said you sometimes load balance across multiple Azure accounts. Is that what you said? And and how I, I'm just trying to understand what that really means, or um, what the benefit of that, what that buys you specifically. Yes, so so that that's I, I'm bringing up a sort of low level feature aspect of Azure Storage, and they're actually getting rid of it now. Um, each storage account, which is like ju just a, your particular storage unit, um, has a transaction limit, and so if you need more transactions, you you needed to shard across multiple table storage accounts. Okay. Um, they're actually fixing that now. This is an ask that we made a while ago that they said, yeah, we want to do what you do. They're actually fixing that now so that you use a virtual account, which is they, they do with the sharding mm -hmm. um, for you. But yeah, if you need a high enough transaction rate. If you need a high enough transaction rate, first they want to talk with you and say, are you really sure you need to do that? You know, is there something wrong with your code? Because uh, most people, there's something wrong with their code. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, if you need a higher transaction rate, uh, the, the, the account has a fixed transaction limit, and then you just shard your limit. And you learned about the limit from talking to team members there, or did you, was it experimentation? Oh, it, it's in public documentation. Oh, okay. In fact, Azure released this, this a, a paper where they evaluated the performance uh, and exactly what performance it got at different transaction rates and what the, the behavior was. That's, okay. that's public information. All right, thanks. You mentioned early on in the talk, which I didn't remember it until now, um, that Azure would just turn off nodes. They um, reboot them. And you personally kind of seem to say, eh, it's not that bad. It helps I like resiliency. It. Yeah, see? That's yeah, I like it. That, that reaction. Um, it, like, so I understand Netflix has this thing in chaos engineering or whatever you want to yeah. call it, but that uh, mindset um, uh, is taking hold. I don't, I think it's great, but it seems, like unless, it seems like for a platform to do it to its customers is a bit different than Netflix doing it to its own house. So is this something that like, was this another one of these feature requests that you had for Azure? Or was this something they wanted to do? Was this a limitation of their early platform? I, I, I'm I mean, curious about that. It, it was, I'll say it was the way their early platform worked. So when we came into it. But not a, a limitation of it? Well, well I, 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 I has, that's, this is why I don't want to use that, that word. Okay. So, we went to Azure thinking this is cloud, and the cloud is about commodity computing, and commodity computers can fail. Disks fail, the CPU fails, networks go down. So we designed from the beginning for failure. And the best way to, to design for failure is to make failure just an everyday occurrence. And you can do that a bunch of different ways. The Azure shutting down the node actually wasn't just like sudden failure. It was literally, you're, we're gonna reboot you, you have five minutes to, to, to acknowledge. This isn't sudden failure. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in stateless computation. You know, if you're designing a cloud service, it should be stateless, it should be multi-master. Failover, it should just be normal. I don't, you know, people talk about, some people talk about DR. And when they say DR, they say DR is when a data center goes down. It's like, DR, you know, data center going down isn't a disaster. If a data center going down is a disaster for you, you have a, you, you have a, you have a problem. Um, and so, within that philosophy of pushing people to build stateless services, it really helps that your service goes down. And the people who did Azure Compute also thought it's, you should be doing stateless, we'll tell you what we're doing, and, and you should just be able to handle that. So this is a part of public documentation then? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the I Azure. I was the impression that it yeah. wasn't. No, 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 saying, no, no. this happened, but no, we were fine with no, it. No, no, the cloud service behavior, they call this, they call this upgrade domains. The, and it's the normal, so there's two upgrades. There's the host upgrade and the guest upgrade. The guest upgrade rolls to your upgrade domains. The host upgrade is just sort of random, but no more than 20% of your nodes at, at the same time. Uh, it is, it's documented. What wasn't documented was the switch to suspending you for 15 seconds. But that made more of our customers happy. And this is, this is you know, going, going to, uh, um, go, going to the, uh, the last talk I saw where, where um, what was the name of the, the uh, base camp, uh, where, where they were talking about, you know, they, they, they just suspend HTTP requests for 20 seconds as they migrate, you know, migrate the database from, from um, you know, from one server to another. It's the same thing. You know, if your clients can handle a 15 second pause, then this is fantastic. Um, 
I, you know, we, design, we designed to be stateless. We just didn't want this particular behavior because the, low, the issue was the load balancers didn't pull the traffic away from it. So then you don't run any data stores yourself? No, we, no, we do not run our own data stores. Even when we have things that, that look like data, data stores, they're still using Azure storage uh, remotely, and that's triple replicated. And, uh, but yeah, we, we don't do our own data stores. Do, does Azure uh, have a SQL product? Yes. And so migrations, or things like uh, database schema migrations work pretty much the same? You just point it at it and it happens? Or? Yeah, yeah, so SQL Azure is a SQL server-based product. Um, there's also uh, standard plugins you can get from other vendors for Postgres, MySQL, whatever. Yeah, we, we don't use much SQL Azure because not much of our stuff is relational, but it's there. Uh, would that have, how would that have affected, if, like, how would that have affected your use case and? Um, um, I think, I, we think Azure storage for key value is much better. Okay. It has very clear semantics. Uh, SQL is still the primary master and then there's, you know, there's some failover rules and what happens and that's fine. But if what you need is key value with eventual consistency, it doesn't buy you much. Thanks.